Do you remember group projects from your school days? Some of you might, some of you joining from home. I see some heads nodding. One of my daughters, I won't say which one in order to protect the innocent, but one of my daughters despised group projects. There always seemed to be at least one kid in her group who, according to her, contributed nothing. While my daughter was conscientiously doing the readings, preparing the documentation, working on whatever the assigned task was, one of her classmates wouldn't even bother to respond to the group emails or texts about the project, let alone do any work. It's not fair, Abba, she would say. I'm doing most of the work, and he's not doing anything. I thought about her feelings of disappointment and even anger this week when I was reading about the seemingly unending debate in Israel about who should be required who should be required to serve in the Israel Defense Forces. And I want to start by acknowledging that when I made Aliyah at age 40, I volunteered for army service. And I knew I was too old for active duty combat, but I figured, who knows, maybe they need a guitarist for the army band or something like that. Maybe they're looking for an American-born reform rabbi with just a little bit of charm to serve. That wasn't funny. I don't know why you laughed about that. <laughs> to serve as an army educator or a trainer, and I was told politely but firmly, we're good. We're good. So I did not personally serve in the army, but at least I tried. The current and, as I said, ongoing debate today is about automatic exemptions from army or even national service for Haredi Jews in Israel. And this week, the Israeli Supreme Court ruled that the government must suspend state subsidies for ultra-Orthodox Jews who study in yeshivot instead of doing military service. And it previously ruled that the government must agree to new legislation that would allow members of this community to avoid being drafted. If they want to go about this, they have to come up with a new plan. And this issue has long been a point of contention in Israeli society since the very first exemptions were granted by Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion when the state was first founded in 1948. Originally, back then, some 400 students were exempted from military service. This was right after the Holocaust, and David Ben-Gurion felt that it was important to rebuild some of the tradition of Torah learning that had been decimated, destroyed in Europe. And so he allowed this small number of students to devote themselves to full-time Torah study. Also, others said at the time, we're not really sure that these soldiers, we have something for them to do. What for them to do that would be meaningful service? But now that number that started at about 400 has grown to the tens of thousands. And many non-ultra-Orthodox Israeli families are wondering why is it that their sons and daughters are required to serve and risk their lives and sometimes even sacrifice their lives while the sons and daughters of the ultra-Orthodox are not. And even more, the state provides generous subsidies to those very same ultra-Orthodox Torah students who aren't serving in the army that it doesn't provide to others. And it strikes many Israelis as fundamentally unfair. And in the middle of this painful, bloody war, it has many folks outraged. Imagine if your child was called to serve and found himself fighting Hamas in Gaza or Hezbollah on the northern border. You lie awake at night worried about your child, imagining the challenging conditions that he or she is facing. And then you realize that the same age children of some of your fellow citizens are spending their days in government subsidized yeshivot, far from the danger and horrors of war. You can understand why many Israelis are reacting with anger. Professor Susie Navot, who's an expert in constitutional law and serves as vice president of the Israel Democracy Institute, wrote this week that this crisis has not yet come to an end. Hopefully, in the next chapters of this series, equal burden will appear. And that's the key point 
equal burden. I read a really inspiring piece this week by Rabbi Yitzchak Aharon Korf, a noted halachic expert and Orthodox Jew who serves communities in Boston and Jerusalem. He published it in the Times of Israel, and he couldn't be more clear. He wrote, I am absolutely disgusted and repulsed by the position of some elected officials, politicians, and political parties that there should be a blanket IDF service exemption for Haredi men. There is absolutely no justification for such an outrageous and unjustified blanket exemption, either logically or halachically, that is, according to Jewish law. And then he goes on to demonstrate unequivocally that Jewish law makes no room for the argument that Torah study should always trump military service. And he makes a very important distinction in the halacha, in Jewish law, between what's known as milchemet reshut, a discretionary war, and milchemet mitzvah, an obligatory war, a war that one has no choice but to fight. And he argues that the current conflict is clearly a milchemet mitzvah, a war we have to wage. In such a war, Rabbi Korf writes, there are absolutely no exemptions whatsoever, least of all, any blanket exemption of an entire segment of the Jewish community. That would be, he writes, in Jewish law, unheard of. What I want to suggest is that now is a time for radical unity. We must all do our part. Here in the diaspora, we can do a lot. We can advocate. We should be reaching out to our elected officials every single day. You can take Shabbat off, but six days a week you should be reaching out and saying, what are you doing today to get the hostages returned? What are you doing today to make sure that representatives of the United Nations or the Red Cross or you name it can go and visit the hostages and make sure that they're being cared for, make sure that they're getting their medications? We need to keep our foot on the accelerator of this every single day, and we should make sure that we are educating ourselves. We should make sure that we're informing others. One of the reasons I wear this little sticker is because our friend Rachel Goldberg asked me to. And when people every day ask me, what's that number, Rabbi? What is that, the lottery number? And then I say, no, that's the number of days that my friend Rachel's son, Hirsch, has been held hostage in Gaza. It's kind of a conversation opener and also a conversation closer because there's this awkward moment. And then they say, tell me more. We can advocate. We can do that right here in the diaspora. We can send our donations. We can reach out to our Israeli friends and family regularly. And when we're able, if we're able, we should go and visit. I'm planning to be in Israel in late June and would love to see you there. If you'd like to come and celebrate our bar, bat mitzvah, or have a cup of coffee, or learn a little bit together. And in December, Cantor, Emma, and I are leading an intergenerational trip to Israel. And you should sign up. You should join us and come and bear witness. Hopefully by then, the war will be over and the hostages will be home. But we can still be there to learn and to express our solidarity. We can hug our family there, the family that we must acknowledge is bearing the brunt of the burden of this war. But as I said in my Yom Kippur sermon this past September, Israel is and always has been the shared project of the Jewish people. And I would argue it's the most important group project our people has ever engaged in. And the burden of it and the meaning and often the joy and pride that comes with it, that must be shared as well. I hope that the current Israeli government and the ultra-Orthodox community in Israel, in all of its diversity, will embrace this opportunity. And I'm confident that between the IDF and national service options, meaningful opportunities for our Haredi brothers and sisters to serve and to give back can be found. And this will do a great deal to unite our people. It will strengthen our people. Even when it's challenging, we are, like it or not, am achad. We are one people with a shared past and a common destiny, a common future. We must be there for each other now more than ever. Am Yisrael 
Hi.